Uh, hello, uh, everyone. I'm Luis Pereira da Silva uh, for the uh, Bank for International Settlements, uh, an organizer, co-organizer of this uh, Green Swan Conference. I'm here to give you a summary of the uh, main messages uh, uh, of the conference and also to relay some of these messages in the next session to Governor Ignacio Visco uh, of the G20 Presidency and the Governor of the Banca d'Italia. The main purpose of the conference was to uh, establish a platform uh, for dialogue and coordination of uh, various actors on climate change to raise awareness and to provide some inputs to the uh, G20 uh, uh, presidency. Just some numbers, uh, we had about 170 uh, journalists with an equal number uh, of item news uh, in the last uh, couple of days. We have a lot of uh, social media and attention vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, uh, this conference with about uh, qu close to 1,200 uh, social media uh, posting. 1800 watches uh, on uh, live streams of uh, our uh, conference and also 30,000 uh, visitors in our conference website. So uh, this is a, a signal that uh, it attracted a lot of interest uh, and I would like to thank all the participants for having devoted time to uh, the sessions, particularly our special guest uh, uh, speakers. Now more than uh, um, a synthesis. Uh, the debates uh, are still, uh, to some extent, uh, very live uh, in our minds. Let me try to give you a uh, selection of topics and discussions that were mentioned uh, throughout uh, these last uh, three days. First of all, about uh, the notion of climate risk. I think it, uh, the awareness battle about this is really well, well uh, uh, underway the characterization of this as a new type of uh, systemic risk. Not something that uh, might happen as a very rare event, but uh, as something that is certain to happen if we don't act. There is full awareness of the complexity of these types of risks, the fact that they can unleash uh, damageable, catastrophic, uh, non-linear type of uh, events that goes much beyond just financial stability, but can threaten a number of uh, uh, human lives and also uh, trigger a number of unforeseen um, uh, consequences. This is what we characterize as, uh, as uh, green swans. And this is why there is a need for uh, many actors to tackle this uh, uh, type of risks. Central banks uh, can, of course, play a uh, coordinating role I will come back to that, but certainly not substitute for other major uh, policy actors. They should use uh, their available instruments, and this is one of the uh, topics that was uh, discussed uh, in this uh, uh, conference. A second is a set of areas where, of course, work is on the way. A lot of discussions took place around a series of topics that I will now try uh, to go one uh, by one. The first is about uh, carbon uh, uh, pricing. Of course, it's a necessary uh, instrument, but it was seen uh, as uh, something that is uh, difficult and complex uh, uh, to implement. Although many uh, uh, um, participants uh, pointed out that the fact that you have an underpricing uh, of, uh, of carbon creates a major risk for uh, uh, financial stability as much as uh, it was the underpricing of risks that led to the 2008 uh, uh, financial crisis. And of course, uh, there were uh, discussions about how to develop uh, carbon markets further, how uh, the appropriate incentive should be uh, put in place, and how you should uh, ensure comparability, homogeneity, in terms of information and indicators that are needed to develop this uh, type of instrument. A second topic was on disclosure, a very, very important issue uh, for addressing uh, risks related to uh, climate change. What are we exposed to in terms of physical and uh, transition risks? And uh, there was a discussion about uh, what characterization should uh, uh, TCFD uh, take place. It was mentioning several times that it should be, of course, more 
mandatory that uh, regulators should take more responsibility in making sure that uh, there is a movement towards uh, TCFD. Uh, the other side that was also discussed is that uh, also spontaneously there is a lot of uh, pressure in society uh, to uh, be aware of uh, the risks that uh, uh, financial systems are uh, running into. The, the notion that uh, the pressure uh, for disclosure can come from shareholders themselves in a sort of uh, move towards uh, radical transparency that because of the new characteristics of communications uh, in our society is also coming uh, very strong. A third uh, topic uh, is uh, regulation. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, coordination is needed here because of uh, green financial regulation faces a risk of uh, fragmentation. Some, for example, some participants uh, mentioned the idea of a green uh, Basel Accord. Some others said that uh, it is uh, a bit more difficult and premature because uh, we do not necessarily have the, the right uh, uh, data uh, or we don't have, for example, still the right uh, taxonomy to engage into a more uh, meaningful type of coordination around the, uh, the topic of uh, prudential, macroprudential regulation and other forms uh, of uh, minimizing uh, risks uh, in the uh, financial uh, sector. But indeed, uh, the idea of making progress uh, uh, in, in this area uh, and particularly improving uh, definitions, improving uh, standards, improving norms, uh, improving certification and verification in order to precisely be capable of engaging into a discussion about prudential regulation uh, in uh, climate change was evoked by many, many uh, participants. Um, a, a topic now of uh, finance, and this has several uh, subtopics. The first one is, of course, the relationship that financing has with the transition to net zero. Some participants said that we were uh, navigating uh, between a scenario where there could be uh, a climate uh, catastrophe, a sort of a Minsky moment for climate, and others saying that uh, there is possibilities of getting into a more sustainable net zero economy because of progress that we are making. Uh, because of this uh, need to, uh, to be cautious, there was the idea of a precautionary imperative vis-a-vis -vis financing the, the transition. Financing the transition to, uh, to net zero meant, of course, uh, to many participants, a close coordination with uh, fiscal policy. And this is very natural because uh, 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 the uh, public resources might have a horizon uh, for returns that uh, go beyond those of uh, more uh, private uh, resources. And therefore, the need to uh, be able to, to finance the new investments, the new alternative technologies, uh, the new means to which you are going to transition to net zero requires a reflection about what place should play uh, fiscal resources, public resources in this game. It is very important because many participants uh, reminded us that many technologies that are needed to this transition are only in the form today of prototypes. And therefore, in order to make them industrial production uh, instruments, uh, you need necessarily to develop them in a much more forceful way. There was also many forceful uh, uh, speeches towards associating uh, the recovery from COVID-19 with the need to finance uh, in a much higher level and more forceful level, the transition to uh, net zero, in particular with pleas to use uh, more investment, more public investment uh, up to say 2% uh, of GDP towards this uh, uh, green uh, recovery. And uh, there was also uh, the idea that uh, this would be precisely the opportunity for uh, providing uh, a more medium and long-term uh, return to those who uh, want to invest in uh, green technologies uh, to, towards uh, net zero. Another theme within finance uh, was uh, financial uh, innovation. 
uh, it's not uh, it's related to the to the fact that uh, there are a number of new technologies to construct uh, net uh, zero portfolios that are coming into play. Uh, how exactly do you elaborate uh, currently this type of, uh, of transition? Uh, how do you technically um, enable uh, financial, uh, the financial sector uh, to construct such portfolio was a topic that was uh, debated. What type of techniques, what type of filters, what type of uh, uh, directions you take in order to ensure that uh, uh, the balance sheets of your institutions converge uh, to uh, the objectives of, uh, of uh, the, the Paris Accord. And then, of course, with, still within finance, there was the idea that uh, this should be done uh, with a public uh, partner, uh, private pi pro public part uh, private uh, partnerships uh, on, on many uh, segments of, uh, of, uh, of financial uh, markets, using also uh, public uh, asset uh, owners and uh, and blended financial uh, techniques. Uh, there was also the idea discussed of uh, new financial instruments that would allow us uh, to sail through this uh, transition. Securities, parametric insurance instruments and resident risk management uh, as uh, service platforms to enable uh, the uh, technology in finance to facilitate the transition to net zero. Of course, a lot of discussion about uh, how to hedge against the climate risk. Uh, as you know, in some areas, there is uh, almost the impossibility of hedging against uh, certain forms of uh, climate risk. So the idea of uh, cat bonds, what markets can be uh, triggered that, uh, uh, to that effect were also discussed in the conference. And then, of course, uh, the idea of uh, data, uh, new sources of data that can perhaps change the, the way in which we map uh, our perception and uh, uh, of uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, emissions. Now, uh, beyond finance, a third topic, uh, big topic discussed in the conference was um, uh, the role, uh, the technical contributions of uh, central banks to, to this uh, debate. Uh, of course, uh, with uh, new models, uh, macroeconomic models, with new uh, risk approaches, with scenario analysis, with uh, analysis of the impact uh, of climate, uh, of inflation, on financial stability, on new techniques for uh, stress uh, testing, but also uh, on how to uh, include these types of risks uh, for uh, rate, uh, rating agencies. It will take some time. It was recognized that because of that, uh, you need perhaps uh, to adopt alternative uh, measures to incorporate climate-related financial risk into the risk management uh, of, uh, of the financial sector and of uh, central banks. And of course, there was a mention that uh, uh, also uh, the central bank community can begin having the uh, measurement of the impact on its own uh, investment uh, of uh, uh, carbon uh, footprint. What, what sort of uh, uh, policies should central banks adopt uh, to make sure that their activities, their monetary policy activities are compatible with uh, a, a net zero commitment by their uh, government? For example, what sort of progress uh, can be considered in incorporating climate uh, risk into uh, both uh, the collateral and the asset uh, purchase programs uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the of central bank uh, community. Uh, uh, there was, of course, a mention of the way in which all this is being uh, uh, done within the uh, coordinating uh, forums that the central bank community has uh, 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 the, uh, defined, for example, the uh, uh, NGFS, the way in which uh, this membership has been very instrumental to precisely develop some of these techniques and tools that I'm uh, referring to. And last but not the least, uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion about the evidence that uh, uh, climate change, but also the policies uh, that uh, fight climate change have distributional uh, consequences. Uh, they affect, uh, as we know, uh, 
primarily poor countries, those that are uh, located in the uh, areas potentially uh, subject to more severe uh, weather events, and of course, even within uh, uh, rich countries, uh, climate change and climate-related uh, uh, risks affect primarily uh, poor households. And therefore, there is, in order to implement uh, mitigation policies, an issue of uh, uh, political economy that has to be considered in the way we see those risks and we design policies uh, to combat those uh, risks. Uh, let me mention, uh, to finish, uh, a topic uh, that was widely discussed uh, and agreed upon in the conference, uh, the need for uh, coordination. Uh, I think the conference itself was uh, the testament of uh, uh, this uh, uh, power of central bank cooperation and to convene. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, one uh, many participants said that uh, these voluntary approaches that we see uh, exist, uh, exist spontaneously today, they probably need to form a, a, a more formal part of the international architecture. So let me conclude by saying that the conference bro brought a wealth of material, food for thought, practical uh, proposals, uh, and now we, what we would like is to put uh, these proposals, of course, uh, in, in a very uh, humble way to uh, the uh, various uh, working groups of the uh, G20 uh, presidency. And therefore, I will uh, pass uh, the floor to uh, Governor uh, Ignacio uh, Visco, uh, who will uh, tell us about uh, the initiatives of the G20 uh, on uh, sustainable finance and how perhaps uh, some of these proposals can be helpful uh, for the reflection that the working groups and the G20 will conduct uh, in the near future. So, uh, Ignacio, thank you very much, and the floor uh, is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Luis. Uh, I'd like really to start by thanking the conference organizers, uh, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, the Bank de France, the International Monetary Fund and the Network for Greening the Financial System for their kind invitation. I also wish to express my heartfelt congratulations for the organizers of this event, uh, especially to you, Luis, for uh, the valuable contributions provided by the participants, uh, along with their commitments and support, our powerful allies on the fight against climate change. This conference confirms that there is now widespread awareness of the importance of uh, the problem. Climate change is having an evident effect on all our countries, threatening economic growth, uh, development and financial stability. The changes that are taking place to the environment also threaten our health, as uh, is shown by the tragedy of the COVID-19 pandemic, with which we are still struggling. Uh, many of the root causes of climate change, such as deforestation, loss of habitat, uh, by increasing the chance of contact between people and wildlife, amplify the risk of the new future pandemics. Contrasting these risks and shifting economic development towards a sustainable path requires a strong and consistent political determination. And the involvement of all human activities as has been very clearly mentioned in all the interventions to this conference. The first step is to transform our energy systems. We need to implement clean and efficient technological uh, actions uh, at uh, unprecedented speed and scale. However, no country can tackle this problem alone, as carbon emissions know no border. Climate change is a particularly dangerous example of a negative externality. Pollution is a cost that spills over not only into other markets besides the one in which it originated, but also into other countries, reducing the effectiveness of national policies. We are realizing it now. It is uh, 50 years and more that uh, we are uh, discussing this issue. I remember the Club of Rome in 1972. I was a young student at the time, really very much vociferous about the risks. They are now very much with us and we have to act. Close international coordination is essential. 
Achieving net zero emissions requires, first of all, the cooperation of all national governments. We must indeed bear in mind that governments are the key players in this context. They are the only institutions that can levy taxes on carbon emissions, introduce uh, re regulation um, in order to curb the, the uh, amount of emissions and provide incentives to green investment. Yet finance can also go a long way in helping and reinforcing this process, channeling resources towards sustainable investments. The Group of 20 is the ideal forum in which global cooperation can take place. G20 country members uh, account for 80% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Achieving the decarbonization of their economies would therefore be a giant leap in the fight against climate change. In the rest of these remarks, really, I would like very briefly to summarize the main activities that we are carrying on, uh, carrying out within the, the finance track of the G20. In, in doing so, I, I will also discuss the main messages that I see stemming from this conference through the lens of work of the G20. Uh, they will be a very useful contribution in the steering of G20 activities. The work of the Italian president of G20 is articulated around uh, three pillars, and they are the people, planet, and prosperity. In line with this vision, contrasting climate change is a key priority. And in this perspective, the finance track is tackling the issue of how to redirect financial flows to support the transition towards a low carbon and more sustainable economy and society. The first step has been to revive the Sustainable Finance Study Group, proposing the United States and China, the largest advanced and emerging economies and the largest greenhouse gas emitters, by the way, as co-chairs. We are very grateful for their decision to accept this responsibility. And uh, I've heard uh, both uh, Jay Powell and Ige really mentioning how much involved and committed they are, they are to this group. Um, in April, we agreed to elevate it to a permanent working group. group, working group. It will be now called the Sustainable Finance Work as designing an effective transition towards net zero will remain a priority for the G20 for many years to come. This group has made rapid progress and has taken several initiatives to promote sustainable finance, including some supporting biodiversity con con conservation. These initiatives are in line with the international priorities stemming from the United Nations uh, COP26 on climate change and the COP15 on biodiversity, both to be held this year and help prioritize these key policy issues. In particular, the group has proposed a sustainable finance roadmap that will be instrumental in future years to address the priorities defined by the G20. The roadmap covers four areas, market development and alignment of financial flows to climate goals information on sustainable risks and opportunities, management of climate and sustainability risks, public finance and incentives. The work will be developed by the group in a transparent way, allowing for flexibility and adaptation as international works and priorities evolve over time. One week ago, the group hosted the Sustainable Finance Roundtable, a public event involving the private sector. The event offered an in-depth perspective on the agenda, providing two new insights. First, there is a growing interest to improve reporting even on other sustainability issues, such as biodiversity. In line with the findings of recent reports, such as the Das Gupta Review, and if I may add it, uh, the Italian Fourth Report on the State of Natural Capital, for which there is an English abstract and which I suppose will be rapidly translated. It's a very, very interesting report. Risks associated with biodiversity loss are in fact closely related to those concerning climate change and in the same way could have significant economic and financial implications. 
The second uh, uh, issue that has been brought forward by the, the, the group uh, has been uh, uh, advocating a special attention to be devoted to setting achievable conditions for small and medium-sized firms regarding the disclosure of climate-related risks. We should consider the principles of proportionality and cost efficiency. We have been discussing also in this conference very much the issue of disclosure by corporations. In this case, really, we realized that there is a large amount of small uh, and medium-sized uh, firms which really have to, their activities have to be taken into account. The group's deliverables for 2021 are expected to focus on three main areas. Sustainability disclosure and reporting, the metrics for classifying and verifying green investment, the alignments of the operations of international financial institutions with the goals of the Paris Agreement. These and other topics will be discussed during two special initiatives of uh, our presidency the high-level symposium on environmental taxation on 9 July and the Venice Conference on Climate on 11 July. The symposium will focus on fiscal policy and in particular carbon pricing in the fight against climate change and will elaborate on the IMF OECD report, joint report on tax policy and climate change. The report provides two main messages, as uh, it has also been, been mentioned here. The first is a proper pricing of carbon emissions, which is still a missing piece in the policy mix required to achieve climate neutrality. And the second concerns uh, the carbon uh, leakage, which clearly uh, uh, implies that uh, competitiveness and the free riding may induce countries to resort to carbon border adjustments. Now, uh, I'd like to elaborate here. The existing explicit and implicit carbon taxes and emissions trading systems align very poorly with the net zero targets. According to the IMF OECD report, 55% uh, of emissions from energy use across G20 countries remain completely unpriced. The World Bank estimates that most emissions are currently priced at $10 or less per tonne of CO2, with a global average carbon price of only $2. The International Renewable Energy Agency, in also considering existing fossil fuel subsidies, uh, comes to the conclusion that the effective price is actually negative. To limit the global warming, the report finds that high emitting countries should price carbon at least $75 per tonne by 2030. Other simulations suggest even higher carbon prices, with estimates varying depending on the stringency of the target and on the hypothesis on the effectiveness of carbon removal technologies. Now there is an urgent need to remove the current distortions in carbon pricing starting from the phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies, and to start encompassing unpriced emissions, as well as to increase the price of those that are covered by a pricing mechanism. To this aim, a useful tool would be a regular stock taking of countries' average carbon prices and of the share of emissions covered in order to facilitate the achievement of a harmonized global level for the carbon price. Uh, Cross-border agreements have important potential benefits, but also face several operational hurdles. From the difficulty in evaluating the emissions embodied in trade flows to their compatibility with international trade rules and the risk of giving origin to green protectionism, which could heighten geopolitical tensions, negatively affecting global trade and investment. The, the concerns around carbon leakage, competitiveness and free riding should therefore be addressed in a coordinated area, in an efficient co co coordinated arena. A, a common uh, carbon price floor applied to all emissions in particular is, is su suggested as a reasonable alternative to CBAs. The, the Venice Climate Conference will connect the dots between public policies and the role of private finance in the transition to net zero, with the aim also to provide a contribution to the next COP26. The work will gravitate around four areas. The first is the role of governments and international institutions in implementing global policies for climate change. 
The second is the initiatives of multilateral development banks in mobilizing climate finance and providing support for the alignment of financial flows with the Paris targets. The third is on the actions of financial regulators for monitoring and mitigating climate risks. And the fourth is on the role of private finance in increasing its commitments to climate and transition finance. The presidency has taken other initiatives to enhance the G20 leadership on the mobilization of private finance. I'd like to mention three of them. We have asked the IMF to consider climate-related data needs in preparing a new data gap initiatives. We have invited the FSB to report on both disclosure and data gaps. We are working actively on these, as it has been mentioned in this conference, uh, and uh, we are uh, convinced that we will deliver very much on these uh, also to the G20 uh, head of states and governments uh, summit. Uh, and these will focus on climate-related financial risk, of course, which have to be disclosed properly. We have proposed to examine how to scale up digital finance to promote sustainable economic growth. And the demand for more and better data to measure the impact of climate change on the economy and the financial system is strong. A new international cooperation initiative is being studied in which G20 countries are responsible for collecting, compiling, reporting and disseminating data, while the IMF and other international organizations would provide methodological advice on data harmonization and on the reporting framework. The uh, FSB initiatives will focus on climate-related financial risks by promoting firm-level disclosures, metrics, for the assessment of climate-related vulnerabilities and the best practices on regulatory and supervisory tools to identify climate-related risks to financial stability. The FSB is also working with the G10 Sustainable Finance Working Group uh, to define a roadmap focusing on climate-related financial risks in order to accelerate the works already underway and to avoid duplications. Finally, the G20 presidency promotes the use of digital finance to help market participants in considering sustainability risks. Harnessing big data, artificial intelligence, remote sensing, and other similar innovative technologies can help to collect and process a very large amount of data sets, increasing transparency and accessibility of information. The recent launch of a G20 Tech Spring 2021 by the Bank of Italy and the BIS Innovation Hub will also be important to this end by encouraging entrepreneurs and startups to develop solutions for data collection and verification, climate risks assessment, and connecting sustainable projects and investors. We have received more than 670 high level applications, a very important result given the complexity of the topics. I'd like now to dedicate a few minutes to one of the key issues in both this conference and the work of the G20, the question of data availability. Improving the assessment of climate-related financial risks and facilitating their integration into investment strategies requires closing data gaps by enhancing disclosure by firms. The quality of information on climate-related risks seem to be lower than those of a financial nature, such as market and credit risks. Uh, this problem is partly due to the wide range of definitions of sustainability risks used by financial investors. In the case of credit risk, for example, the common definition considered in the market leads to a high correlation of credit scores across rating agencies. In the case of sustainability risk, on the other hand, as we have really uh, observed in, in our investment policy, there are very diverse definitions spanning from those more concerned with its short-term financial effects to those more attentive to the long-term impact of sustainability, and the correlation is rather low. As a consequence, uh, the, this low correlation also puts some uh, uncertainty about which are the score providers that we should rely more on. Uh, a, a common definition of sustainability is, uh, is a necessary ingredient to improving corporate disclosure. 
disclosure standards based mostly on voluntary practices are highly heterogeneous in quantity and in quality. According to the Global Outlook for Sustainable Investment 2021 by the OECD, ESG data cover about um, 90%, 95% of listed firms in terms of market capitalization in the US, 90, uh, 90% 89% in the European Union. Data availability, however, is limited to large corporations. Smaller firms, which are often less polluting than larger ones, could lose the opportunity to raise capital at lower costs unless they improve their sustainability disclosure. This is uh, one of the main uh, issues, as I said, that came out from the roundtable uh, of the G20 Sustainable Finance uh, Working Group that we had last week. To ease the disclosure burden, smaller firms should resort more intensively to digital innovation, which can provide creative and efficient solutions by leveraging on big data and artificial intelligence. To increase the diffusion of sustainability information, the contribution of private sector actors is essential. Greater attention to the environment is primarily in their own interest. Today, the fate of firms depend not only on their productivity, but is also co connected uh, to the societal and environmental welfare of its stakeholders, its customers. Indeed, consumers and investors are increasingly more attentive to sustainability issues. The initiative of the International Financial Reporting Standards, the IFRS, uh, to establish a sustainability standard board is, is a move in the right direction for creating a global, credible, verifiable reporting system on sustainability. But to ensure that all firms disclose information on sustainability by respecting a set of minimum standards, both in the reporting and in the harmonization regulation, in, the, in, the, in, the, in terms of reporting and harmonization, in order for this to take place, regulation will play an essential role. Uh, members of the G20 uh, will have to continue working together over the coming years to agree on basic principles which can make disclosed data comparable across countries, allowing the market to verify the alignment of investment with uh, the targets, the sustainability targets. Uh, these are the so-called taxonomies. Uh, uh, and and uh, preserving the flexibility required to adapt them to region or country-specific features. Uh, in this regard, I, I fully share Mark Carney's uh, endorsement of a widespread mandatory reporting in line with the recommendation of the FSB's task force on climate-related financial disclosures. Uh, greater disclosure would also considerably help uh, all of us, uh, central banks, to integrate climate risks in our monetary policy operations, as suggested at this conference by, by many, among whom also Jens Weidman. Uh, higher quantity and quality of uh, information on sustainability is also key to ensuring the mar that market works effectively. Uh, informational efficiency on sustainability will allow market discipline to function. Uh, trustworthy issuers with leading sustainability practices will uh, benefit from more favorable financing conditions and the lag laggards will be penalized or induced to taking more credible or ambitious steps towards the transition. The market mechanism could also be a powerful tool to prevent greenwashing, as this risk materializes the reputational cost for unfair behavior would be costly and would help to single out falsely misleading actors and instruments. A final issue that I'd like to touch on concerns the role of supervisory authorities on central banks. Uh, they are active participants in, in the G20, and, and uh, as this conference uh, shows, uh, they are also very much willing to act. The task of supervisory authorities is complicated by the fact that there is no widely accepted methodology yet to assess climate-related risks and verify whether financial firms take these risks into account in their lending practices. 
Now, the main tool is a reliable scenario analysis. It has uh, much discussed here. Uh, and uh, the standardized climate scenarios prevailed by the NGFS is, in my view, very promising for providing a common reference framework for assessing the implications, the macro and financial implications of climate change. While this analysis is uh, the key ingredient for performing climate sensitivity analysis of financial vulnerability, with the, the stress test, we should be aware of the limitations and potential oversimplifications uh, related to this tool. It would therefore be advisable to consider the possibility that the impact of climate-related risks is larger than suggested by this analysis, especially if transition and physical risks reinforce each other, as Professor Engel has explained during this conference. Climate-related risks also affect credit and market risks, making it difficult to measure their true extent. And this task is challenging as it requires the combination of data on bank exposures with estimates of the effects of disaster. In other words, a low probability event with very large negative consequences uh, in the case of physical risk and uh, of significant changes in climate policy in the case of transition risk. The complexity of assessing the fault probabilities and losses given the fault makes cooperation authorities especially among authorities especially valuable. And um, uh, as firm data disclosure and scenario analysis improve, uh, this will allow financial intermediaries to make a regular and wider use of these tools into climate stress testing and sensitivity analysis, as already emphasized during this conference, and will become obviously required by supervisors. The role of central banks in this area is multifaceted. Central banks could lead the market by example by disclosing their climate-related exposure and methodologies used to integrate climate risks in their investment and risk management practices for their own portfolios in line with the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. We at the Bank of Italy have been doing this since a few years and we can uh, report a couple of, of lessons. Uh, the first is that from a risk return perspective, the good performance of ESG investments that we had already observed in 2019 has been confirmed last year, showing the resilience of our new portfolio to the outbreak of the pandemic, better returns and, low, and low volatility, lower volatility. And second, integration strategies such as a narrow exclusions or tilting uh, would be preferred with respect to two core exclusions or pronunciating measures, certainly in the transition. With regards to monetary policy, we must be aware that climate change and a transition towards net zero affect the uh, transmission channels, for example, by determining the trend growth of key variables. We need, therefore, to integrate climate and sustainability variables into our macro financial models. This has been rightly stressed in this conference, among others, by Francois Villeroy de Gallo. How exactly to do this, however, is still an open question. With the possible exception of the oil market, we only have a superficial understanding of the energy market and of the way climate change affects the rest of the economy. In this respect, I welcome the announcement given even during this conference of the creation of a new joint initiative for central bankers and supervisors climate training alliance with the active role of the BIS and the NGFS for training and developing skills on climate related scenarios. The role of climate change in monetary policy is currently under consideration within the ECB strategy review. I think that while we should certainly contribute to assess and counter climate risks, we should be prudent in the active use of our monetary policy instruments for this purpose, uh, carefully considering the cost and benefits of our actions with reference to the efficacy of the transmission mechanism and the effects on economic activity and carbon uh, emissions. We have to be active, but we have to be very careful about the effects of our actions, uh, both on climate and on economic activity. Uh, a more climate-oriented purchase of assets is currently hampered by the fact that climate-related data and climate-aware instruments are still underdeveloped. Uh, as for the latter, the outstanding value of green bonds is very limited. It is about 3.5% to total us globally. Within the euro area, green bonds represent less than 2 and 7% of the eligible instruments for the euro system purchase programs of government and corporate bonds, respectively. In sum, the 
thinness of the green bond market and the low liquidity of secondary market would envisage a still limited room for monetary policy interventions in this realm. But there is no question that this room must and will increase over time. And with that, the ability of central banks, the ECB in particular, to incorporate the greening in the economy in the pursuing of our price stability mandate. Going forward, supervisors and central banks need to continue discussing how tackling climate-related financial stability risks, and this requires policy instruments or approaches that go beyond existing ones. But while macroprudential and monetary policy may play an important role in the path to net zero, it should be clear that, as has been said and stressed also by Lewis in its conclusion, that what central banks can do directly for climate change remains limited compared to what the governments can obtain and must do. Let me conclude. A widely mentioned report by the International Energy Agency found that in order to limit the rise of the global temperature to 1.5% centigrade, the threshold that if surpassed would bring catastrophic consequences for people and the planet, no new oil and gas fields or coal mines should be developed by today. Annual investment in the energy sector will have to more than double by 2030. There should be no sales of new internal combustion engine passenger cars by 2035, and the global electricity sector should reach net zero emissions by 2040. Even though some of these results may sound overly extreme or even provocative, we cannot hide the fact that the transition to net zero will imply high costs. The global demand for energy, for example, has not reached the plateau, and without a sufficient increase in production, consumer prices will necessarily rise. Returns in highly polluting sectors will worsen as the market for their products shrinks and some firms will exit the market, even though greener firms will enter in their place. If we want to limit the climate-related risks for our economies, we cannot postpone our actions. All the available analysis show that a delayed and disorderly transition will hamper future economic growth, threatening global financial stability with self-reinforcing effects. On the opposite, Prompt and clear policies can limit risks and help countries attracting the resources needed to finance their low carbon transition. Most studies suggest that the economic impact of the green transformation will be positive in the long run. The short run, however, will see a significant reallocation of labor across sectors and regions. The transition will be especially tough for developing economies as they face an increasing thirst for energy driven by industrialization and rising consumption. These difficulties add to those caused by the pandemic crisis, which is already reversing the progress made over the last few years in the fight against extreme poverty and energy poverty. I believe that um, a lot therefore needs to be done to ensure not only a transition to net zero, but also a just transition. Adequate investment in skills, active labor market policies, and modern social protection systems will be crucial to make sure that nobody is left behind. The progressive phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies, possibly not so progressive, often regressive actually in nature, uh, can increase the fiscal space of developing countries and provide them with fresh resources, which can then be directed to improving the energy access of the most vulnerable. The recourse to innovation, innovative financial instruments, such as debt for nature swaps, could help to reduce the debt of developing economies and to raise funds for conservation projects and increasing the stock of carbon dioxide natural removals. In moving towards a greener world and a safer planet, we must not repeat the mistakes made when globalization took place. The impact on the most fragile workers and vulnerable segments of the population should be always accounted for in the design of climate policies. These will not be forgotten by the G20, whose finance ministers and central bank governors recently stated that shaping the recovery from the pandemic provides a unique opportunity to develop forward-looking strategies, investing in innovative technologies, and promising just transitions toward more sustainable economies and societies, with particular attention to the most affected segments of the population and in line with the Paris Agreement. And this ends the quote. And ends also my remarks, uh, thanking uh, very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio, for uh, giving us uh, the uh, highlights of the uh, G20 uh, Italian uh, uh, presidency. I I'm sure that uh, the work uh, uh, that uh, uh, will be done will achieve uh, the goals uh, that uh, you mentioned. So, well, uh, this is the end of this uh, Green Swan uh, conference. Uh, of course, we will uh, continue working on uh, climate uh, risk uh, issues with uh, the BIS and with our co-sponsors, the Banque de France, uh, the uh, IMF and the uh, NGFS. I'd like to thank uh, all the uh, participants, the panelists, the speakers, the attendees. I'd like to thank uh, Cristalina, uh, Augustine, uh, François, Frank, Sylvie uh, and Tao. Uh, and I would like to uh, give a special thanks to the uh, technical teams that have worked uh, hard uh, to make uh, this uh, conference possible and especially my colleagues here at uh, the technical team uh, in uh, Basel at uh, the BIS. Thank you very much and goodbye.